church, we're going to be reading from Galatians 5 and a couple of different readings from Titus chapter 2. Galatians 5 and Titus chapter 2. Let me read them for us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In Titus 2, we read, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This is the word of God. My name is Adam. I'm the lead pastor here at Brave Park Community Church, and it's great to have you join us. Before we uh, turn our attention to God's Word, let me just mention a couple of things that are coming up in the next few weeks. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and Ben will be opening up God's Word for us, which I'm looking forward to. And that means the weekend after that is Easter. Now, like Ben mentioned, unfortunately, we won't be able to have Easter on the lawn or, or gather together in our building, but we will have Easter services. Good Friday, 9 a.m., Easter Sunday, 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And I just wanted to encourage you to think about and to pray about who you can invite to church on Easter. Who can you send the link to of our live-streamed services? You know, we're in a bit of a, a lockdown at the moment, but the Spirit of God is not locked down. The mission of God is not locked down. We can continue to be involved, to pray, to give, to invite others, to reach out to others and invite them uh, to our Easter services. So let me just encourage you to think about who you can invite to Easter this year. But why don't you now join me in prayer as we open up God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. As we open it now, Lord, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to obey what you are saying to us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, this is the final week in our sermon series exploring what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. For two months now, we've been exploring the characteristics that God is producing in our lives by the presence and power of His Spirit. Spirit. If you've missed any of those sermons, you can catch them all on our website. So far, we've looked at love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and today we come to self control. Self control. Now, this is probably the easiest of the fruit to define. I mean, it's pretty self explanatory, isn't it? Self-control is the ability to control yourself, to restrain your appetites, to govern your desires. In fact, the Greek word for self-control in Galatians 5, it's a combination of two words. Ego, which means self, and krat, which means strength or power or mastery. And when you put them together, it means to have strength or power or mastery 
over yourself. But the fact is, though self-control is easy to define, it's a whole lot harder to do. It's a whole lot more difficult to put into practice. Now, to illustrate this, I'd like us to do a little bit of an experiment, a, a, a exercise. Now, what I want you to do, kids, I especially want you to, to join in on this. I want you to take your right foot and make clockwise circles with it. Just go round and round with your right foot in a clockwise direction. Then, with your right hand, keep your right foot going in clock, clockwise direction. Then, with your right hand, draw the number six in the air. Now, what happened? Your foot went in the other direction. You see, it's not that easy to control ourselves. Maybe, kids, you find it a little bit difficult to control yourselves around junk food. I remember when I was a bit younger, my parents took me to Pizza Hut for my birthday. Now, back then, Pizza Hut wasn't just a takeaway place. It was an all-you-can-eat pizza buffet. Makes me happy just remembering it. Now, on that night, I took that as a particular personal challenge. I ate all that I could eat on that birthday night. In fact, I ate so much that when I got home, I vomited. See, it's not always that easy to control ourselves. And yet it's so important that we do. In fact, there was a famous test or experiment done in Stanford in the 1970s. It was called the marshmallow test. Now, essentially, researchers sat down a five-year-old child and they put a, a marshmallow in front of them and they said, if you don't eat that marshmallow for 15 minutes, if you leave it alone, then when I come back, I will give you a second marshmallow. If the child was to eat the marshmallow that was in front of them, then they wouldn't get another one. Now, it was a fascinating experiment, but what made it famous was what happened 10, 20 years later. Researchers found that the kids who were able to hold off from eating the marshmallow, they were more likely to have higher grades and fewer behavioral problems. It was thought to highlight the importance of self-control. Now, of course, there's a whole lot of other things that go into grades and behavioral problems, but the reality is self-control is an incredibly important virtue. And this is why the Bible repeatedly calls on us to live self-controlled lives. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, we read that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And then in the passage we just read a, a moment ago in Titus chapter 2, we read that the grace of God teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now again, like gentleness, self-control is also an essential requirement for Christian leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 2, now the overseer, the elder, is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled. Self-control is an essential part of the Christian life. And to help us understand self-control, to help us grow in self-control, I'd like to explore this topic under just four simple headings. The first, if you're taking notes, and kids, maybe you want to write this down as well, it is the need for self-control. The need for self-control. Now, the truth is, as I've already mentioned, we all lack self-control. You do, I do, even my grandparents do. Now, how do I know this? Well, the Bible tells me so. In fact, in Titus chapter 2, the passage that we read, Paul is writing to Titus, a young, ch young church leader, and he gives four main groups in the church life instructions for living. He, he talks to older men, older women, younger men, and younger women. And to all four groups, he calls on them to be self-controlled. To the older women, he connects it to wine, and I'm not going to make any comment on that today. To the younger men, and this is pretty funny, he just says, be self-controlled. That's it. I can kind of imagine them thinking, well, where do you want us to be self-controlled, Paul? And he just responds, everywhere, all the time, everything you do. Just be self-controlled. 
I mean, that's enough of a challenge for, for young men, isn't it? We all lack self-control. We probably don't even need the Bible to tell us this. I mean, we know this from our experience. We probably all have areas of our life that we find difficult to control. It might be how much we drink or how much we eat. Maybe it's uncontrolled spending or a, a gambling addiction. Maybe we struggle to control our temper or our tongue. Maybe it's what we look at online. Or, or maybe it's our emotions or our thoughts. And if you can't think of anything that's out of control in your life, then let me help you. Pride is out of control in your life. We all lack self-control. And this is true even in small things. I mean, a smartphone is a pretty small thing, isn't it? You can fit it in your pocket. But I wonder if you control it or if it controls you. How many times a day do you check it? How much time in your day do you spend scrolling? Maybe it's just something simple like getting enough sleep. Maybe you, you, you can't get to bed on time because you just have to watch that next episode on Netflix or just play that next level on the computer game, whatever it is. We all lack self-control. And if you're a Christian, you, you shouldn't be surprised by this. Because the concept of self-control, it implies that there is a war going on within us. Which is exactly what the Bible says. In 1 Peter chapter 2, for example, Peter writes and he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires. Which what? Which wage war against your soul. There is a war going on within us. And what this means is that we cannot always or automatically trust what we feel, what we think, what we desire. Because our desires flow from a self that is divided, a heart that is deceitful. And this means that we will experience desires we need to deny. We will experience impulses that we need to control. Now, I realize how incredibly countercultural this is. In fact, this is one of the most countercultural and difficult teachings of the Bible, especially in our day, because this is the opposite of what we're told. I mean, we are told repeatedly and in so many different ways if you want to live a truly fulfilling life, you should not deny your desires, you should indulge them and express them. You should get in touch with who you really are on the inside. You should be who you want to be. You should do what you want to do. And you should not let anyone else tell you differently. I mean, there's a number of different phrases that are used to describe this kind of view. It's been popularized by sayings like, be true to yourself, follow your heart, you do you. But I think it's summarized most aptly by the song, Let It Go, from the movie Frozen. Now, if you haven't seen it, it's sung by a character named Elsa who's kind of forced by her parents and by society to hide her true self, to restrain her true desires. But in a moment where she breaks out, where she lets it go, where, where she expresses what's on the inside, she sings this, It's time to see what I can do, to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go. Let it go. Now, I assured everyone else that I wouldn't sing it this week, and I didn't, so there you go. I mean, this is the air that we breathe. And this is why we chafe when the Bible says to us, no, we need to exercise self-control over our desires. And this is why we need to look at our second point, which is the goodness of self-control. The goodness of self-control. Because the reason that we chafe at the idea of self-control, of living within certain boundaries, of denying certain desires, is we think it sounds restrictive. We, th we think it sounds limiting, as if it's to live an impoverished kind of life. But actually, the opposite is true. To cast off self-control does not lead to liberation, it leads to destruction, devastation. This is what we read in Proverbs 25, verse 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through, is a person who lacks self-control. 
Now, in the ancient world, for a city to not have walls around it, well, it means it wouldn't be a city for very long. Because wild animals could come in, robbers could come in, and eventually armies would come in, and they would lay waste to that city. Now, in the same way, if we don't have self-control, if we give in to every deceitful desire, to every temptation, we are like a city without walls. We'll eventually be overrun. We'll do things that we never thought we would do. We'll go places we never thought we would go. I mean, the reality is, without self-control, resentment can become murder. Jealousy can become paranoia. Rationalizing can become lying. Lust can become adultery and so on. And this is why self-control is so good and so important. It protects us from ourselves. It protects us from being derailed. In fact, to have self-control is kind of like a train on a train track. Now, if that train comes off the track, it doesn't become a free train. It doesn't become a liberated train. It becomes a stuck train, a broken train, a derailed train. And the tracks are actually what set that, sets that train free to be what it's meant to be and to do what it's meant to do. In the same way, the virtue of self-control, it's what sets us free. It's what liberates us to be who God made us to be. To enjoy true freedom, which is slavery to God. Now you might be thinking, yes, Adam, I I, I agree that self-control is good. I agree that we need to deny certain desires and pursue others. But to be honest, I find it so hard. I feel so powerless sometimes. I mean, I've promised myself, I've promised God that I won't do this, I won't go there, I won't say this, I won't click on this, but I do. And I just wonder if I'm even strong enough. And this leads us to our third point, which is the power for self-control. I mean, where does the power for self-control come from? Where do we get the power to control ourselves? Well, according to the Bible, it does not come from ourselves. We need a power from outside of us. I think we see this, you know, many years ago, there was a campaign against drug use in the 1980s in America. It was led by Nancy Reagan, and the catchphrase for this anti-drug campaign was, just say no. Now, the idea was, if someone offers you drugs, you just say no. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, the campaign had very little effect. Young people continued to use drugs at an increasing rate. Because to just say no doesn't really work. Maybe you've experienced this in your own life. You've thought to yourself, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to eat that chocolate. I'm not going to drink that, look at that, go there. You might last a day, a month maybe even a few months, but eventually you give in to that temptation. Because willpower is not enough. We need a power that comes from outside of ourselves. And thankfully, this is what the Bible tells us that God has given us. That through the presence of His Spirit, through the gift of His grace, we receive a new ability to say no. For example, this is what we read in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Now, the grace of God not only saves us, the grace of God also teaches us how to live. Ed Welch is a highly regarded Christian counselor, and he's written an excellent article called Self-Control, The Battle Against One More. In this article, he writes, he says, Scripture never expects us to hear God's commands to us in isolation from the serious contemplation of God's work for us in Christ. Listen to this. This is a really profound insight. Paul begins all his letters with grace to you and ends them with grace be with you. Self-control is possible because of the grace of God given us in Jesus Christ. It is this ever-present grace that teaches us to say no. Now, how does this work? What does this look like? Well, it means that we remember that in Christ, God has 
forgiven us, loved us, accepted us. Not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, not because we were so self-controlled, but simply because of His great mercy. We have been brought into His family purely and simply by grace. And this means we now long to serve Him, to love Him, to thank Him, to obey Him. This means if we want to grow in self-control, we don't just need stronger willpower. We need deeper meditation on the grace of God. We need the grace of God not just to be a theory that we kind of talk about on Sundays. We need the grace of God to be a reality that we live Monday through Saturday. Let me explain it this way. You know that there are children in poverty all over the world. But what is it that moves you to give to compassion, to the New Life Orphanage, as you so often and so regularly do? Well, it's seeing the reality of what's happening and what's being done about it. When you see the videos and hear the stories of lives being changed, what was just theory to you suddenly becomes vivid and real to you, and it moves you to give. We need the grace of God to move from just theory, and we need it to become vivid and real to us. And when it does, it will move us to self-control. We will say, I've been bought with a price. Christ shed his own blood for me. I want to glorify God with my life. I want to honor God with my body, with my mind, with my emotions. So I will say no to this and I'll say yes to God. The power for self-control, it comes from the gift of God's grace and the presence of God's spirit. Now this doesn't mean that we have nothing to do. No, it means we are now empowered and equipped to obey God, to engage in our battle with sinful desires. And this leads us to our fourth and final point, which is the practice of self-control. And I use the word practice intentionally because that's what it's going to take. I mean, self-control is kind of like a muscle. The more we stretch it, the more we exercise it, the more we use it, the stronger we will become. So what does this look like practically? How, how do we grow in self-control in our day-to-day lives? Let me offer two suggestions. The first is this. Prepare for hard work. Prepare for hard work. You know, to change your habits, to deny your desires is incredibly difficult. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul compares the Christian striving for self-control to an athlete training for the Olympic Games. He says in verses 25 to 27, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. Now, that's great language, and, and you can see what he's saying saying he trains and he fights for self-control. It doesn't come easy. He works at it like an athlete preparing for the Olympic Games. So here's the question. Do you want self-control? Do you really want it? It's going to take hard work. It's not just going to magically appear in your life. It's going to require effort and it's going to require a plan. It's going to require you to, to... take some things out of your life and to put some things into your life, to stop doing certain things and to start doing other things. It might be any number of practical things, having a a fixed bedtime, installing an internet filter, deleting someone's number from your phone, putting a limit on your phone usage or, or how long you spend on social media. And that would be a really great thing to do in this time. It might be any number of things, but at the heart of any plan, will be Jesus Christ. Because the more we get to know and enjoy Jesus, the less attractive sin will become to us. It's like the old hymn that says, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So the first step we need to do is we need to prepare for hard work and we need to make a plan. The second thing that we need to do is we need to contemplate the return of Christ contemplate the return of Christ. Now, I say this because in Titus 2, after Paul reminds us about God's grace to us in Christ, he then goes on to remind us about the return of Christ. He says in verse 12, we're able to live self-controlled lives while we wait for the blessed hope, 
the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible regularly combines these two things, the call for self-control and the hope that we have in the return of Christ. Now, why does it do this? What are the benefits of us meditating on the return of Christ? Well, really, two things. The first is it provides us with a deadline. It provides us with a deadline. You know, a couple of years ago, before I had kids, I used to do some squad swimming early in the morning. Now, those sessions could be pretty torturous, especially during winter. But what made me able to endure it, to swim lap after lap, it was knowing that at 7 a.m. it would all be over. Now, the battle with sin is incredibly hard and incredibly draining. And if there's no end, we would easily give up. But the Bible tells us that there is a day coming when the fight will be over. When Jesus will return, when all enemies will be defeated. Sin, suffering, sickness and death. And so we can fight We can keep going because we know the end is coming and our king is near. So if you've sat down on the battlefield, if you've stopped fighting, can I encourage you to stand up and to enter the fray? Fight your sinful desires because your sin-killing king is coming. To meditate on Christ's return provides us with a deadline. It also reveals our true destiny. You know, if Christ is coming to defeat and destroy sin and evil, it means, as the Bible tells us, that one day we will be sinless. We will be as God intended us to be. You know, we often excuse our addictions and and sin and desires by saying, well, I'm, I'm just human. I can't help it. But actually, according to the Bible, to be truly human is to be like Christ. To be not controlled by our passions and desires, but to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Ed Welch says in that article I mentioned a moment ago, we were created, he says, to have passions that are directed to the glory of God. If you have put your faith in Christ, your destiny is to be absolutely sinless. Now is the time to start acting like the person you will soon be. The way we grow in self-control is we prepare for hard work and we make a plan and we contemplate the coming of Christ. And when we fail and when we fall, not if, but when, when we lack self-control, we can turn to God and we can receive His grace, knowing that He has promised us He will finish in us what He has started. And so as we come to the end of this series on the fruit of the Spirit, It's my hope and it's my prayer that you would not be feeling overwhelmed by all that God wants from you. It's my hope and it's my prayer that you would be feeling hopeful, that you would be filled with longing and expectation about what God is doing in and through you and about what God wants to do in and through us as a church. If you're a Christian, your life is safe in the the hands of our Heavenly Father. It's redeemed by the blood of His precious Son and it is empowered by the presence of His life-giving Spirit. And this means you can go into your life. You can become a person filled to overflowing with the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And as we do that, now more than ever, we are in a position to shine the goodness of God, to show the love of Christ. And so let's do that together. We might not be together physically, but we are united in spirit and our God is with us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone. We thank you that you have given us your spirit. We ask and pray that we might continue to be led and filled with and guided by your spirit, that we might become people who are filled to overflowing with the fruit of your spirit. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of grace that you have given to us through the work of your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that in him we stand before you loved, forgiven and accepted so that when we fail and when we fall, we can stand up and we can move forward. 
And so, Lord, we just want to submit ourselves to you today. We want to trust you in all things. And we want to know that you are at work in all things for our good and for your glory. So fill us and lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.